it was a welcoming room, like stepping into a hotel lobby. And it was underground. And they had a big sign up. Welcome in Smas. <laughs> and the base belonged to the Germans. And we were brought to them and said, this is the class of Langley of 1964. And I was nine years old and didn't speak much of anything. You know, toddler level English. So we come out. And the person who took us there talked to her in German, and we were assigned a bunk room where all 12 of us were there, both genders, and we were roommates for the duration of our stay until we graduated from Shula. So uh, we went from being in solitary confinement when we weren't being tortured to suddenly sharing a room with 11 other people. <laughs> you know, it took some adjusting and we had to learn to speak German. We had to learn to um, fit into a Teutonic culture where the abilities that we had been mastering at Langley we were not allowed to use on, on each other or on yeah. the Germans. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were sense. told, don't forget them. You're going to need them in the war. <laughs> but uh, we were basically at that point, we were treated like kids. But we didn't have parents. We had people assigned to keep an eye on us. So it was more like being raised in an orphanage. But we went to school. We learned to contribute to the, to the community. We learned to become part of, and we were accepted into their culture, even though they didn't want us to contribute to their gene pool because they didn't want the Draco DNA. Okay. It wasn't that they didn't want us. They were very frustrated because they had very much wanted us. They just didn't want the Draco DNA. Now, when I was in Shula on Mars, um, that's school for Germans, I was taught a lot of things very differently than how they're taught here. And I think that's to the credit of the Germans there that they took this kid who was meant to be a slave and educated me. And they incorporated me into their military. And I was an officer and, I, okay, I was still property that they owned and they still called me a miscabert, um, an abortion that lived. So, but insulting people is part of their culture you know, that's kind of how they show affection is by calling you names. So um, they were kinder to me than the CIA was. And remember, I had no memory of my parents. Mm. So this is the way this altar remembers life is having torture and training that included torture and then going to Mars, where I was put into school with their own kids and treated the same as everybody else. So my understanding of the Germans is very different than a lot of other people. The first place on Mars that was settled, they called it Prima, or first, Prime. And they called it Aries because that's what they called it in German. That's the ancient name for the planet Mars is Aries. So this, this was originally a military base called Aries Prima. 
Now, I don't remember exactly where it is, but I keep looking at Mons Olympus on the, on the map. So I'm going, if I had to put my finger on something, I would say it's in there. Now, most of it is underground. There is an opening that allows ships to come in. And it's faced with a force field that keeps out the sandstorms and invaders. And that entire level of the base is just for the ships. Now these can be spaceships, these can be planes, these can be shuttles. And all of them are in use on Mars and have been since the beginning. Uh, when I was brought there in 1964, they already had multiple layers. And I was taken to a lair that housed children that were going to school. It was the school that the Germans had created for their own children. And because we were going to be serving with them, they didn't want us to be stupid. That's one of the things that the Germans do that the other factions don't. The other factions will just train you for your job just what you need to know for your job. You're basically a street child with skills. Where the Germans were creating a educated class of people to serve in their Mars militia. Mm -hmm. So this was a school that wanted to produce people who could think. The Russian kids that were in the German faction were put through Shula as well. This, is, this was not just me. This was not just our group. This was their standard operating procedure. Over half were German, uh -huh. and the rest of them were Americans and a couple of other ethnic groups. So almost half of us were expected to become part of the Mars Defense Force. Mm -hmm. We were basically already enlisted in their military okay. and we considered this very basic training. Most of the Germans were married couples and ha were encouraged to have children. So they had lots of kids and most of the moms were full-time moms, and they did their chores while the kids were at school. We had a uniform <laughs> that we wore. It was pants for, for the boys and skirts for the girls, and otherwise it was basically identical. White shirts, orange ties. The girls had a bow tie. The boys had a, a Windsor knot, uh, brown cardigans, and God awful ugly brown shoes. We had been kept so isolated. We mostly didn't know how to talk. We didn't know how to interact with each other. And so we had to learn how to bathe. We had to learn how to do hair. We had to learn how to keep our uniforms clean. We had to learn how to get along with the kids in Shula. And those were the kids of the colonists and the German militia. We were used to having our heads shaved and not having a parent figure. So we had to learn how to, to take care of our clothes. We had to learn how to present ourselves in a military fashion. And we had to learn to follow their regulations, which were very different from what Langley had imposed on us. So we were immediately put into immersion with the German kids in their Shula, which was taught Prussian style, which for Americans, that means you were sitting at a small wooden desk with a seat and you had a slate that you wrote on with chalk. You said everything out loud. 
And if you said it wrong, the teacher smacked the back of your hand with a ruler. And it, yes, it had a metal strip at the end. This is the way Shula was taught. And they got the results they were looking for. They were not about a group of independent individuals. They were about a military that worked as a unit. So these were kids of soldiers on a military base being taught to be soldiers. Or they were kids like me who basically were enlisted from the time we got there. And they were training us. Now, to their credit, the Germans wanted us educated. They wanted us to be able to read and write, to do math, to understand astrophysics, to understand exobiology, exopolitics, and they taught us self-defense before they taught us our job. So we were completely educated. By the time I graduated at 19, so 10 years of Shula, I had the equivalent of an AA in California. The culture out there is Teutonic. It is a warrior society. Um, they encourage aggressiveness, but at the same time, respect for authority is demanded. So you have to behave in class, but what you do to your peers outside of class, um, as long as you don't get caught, it's okay. Uh, you start being destructive or killing people and you end up in trouble. Or if you sass the teacher, you're in trouble. But there's a lot of tormenting each other and you are expected to deal with it and earn your place your place in the pecking order. So it's, it's very different from America today. America today, kids are coddled and they don't know how to do much of anything besides whine and complain. And their parents are giving them everything they want. <clears throat> I know this is a generalization and there are people it doesn't apply to. And we came to this place that, yeah, we had to earn our, our place in the world. But we were rewarded for being productive. You know, we were not being tortured. We were, we were treated like we had some value. And this was my first time growing up. So my initial growing up in this incarnation was on Mars with the Germans. So in a lot of ways, those are my people. So I feel like I'm bombarded by people who think all Germans are evil. And they're not. They're just people in a different culture. And that's, that's a very hard thing for people on Earth who have been listening to World War II propaganda for 80 years and World War I propaganda for 20 years before that. You know, where you look at it and so close to 100 years, the Germans have been being vilified. And then I grew up with them and it's like, yeah, they're, they're a military culture, but they don't automatically hate you. Um, I will say that what I learned in Shula on Mars was 90% factually correct. After I came back and I was in school in California, what I was taught in California, my second childhood, <laughs> was only 40% factually correct. The rest of it was all propaganda. So you got to give them credit for telling the straight truth.
what they started with was German language and literature sure. and their own history. They talked about their colonies in Africa and they put it in perspective of they were the last colonizer there and that they went in and that there was a revolt and yes, they killed too many people and they put it in terms of the time period was when Cecil Rhodes killed millions in South Africa and King Leopold of Belgium killed mm -hmm. 20 million in the Congo. So they said, yes, we were bad, but the others were worse. That that was a bad time period. And at least the ones on Mars regretted it. And so they were honest about, yes, we did this, which you hear the descriptions on in California and they never even mentioned Cecil Rhodes or Leopold, but uh, you know, mm -hmm. there were horrors done, outrageous. And they're just all being covered up. So um, the Germans taught me about it. And then I'm back on earth and, and I'm now remembering what I was taught there. And I started doing my homework to see, okay, who is telling the truth here? And once we understood how to speak mm -hmm. German and where the culture was coming from, then they started us with basic math basic astrophysics which was taught very differently there they said that einstein was wrong his relativity was wrong that first off the speed of light is not a constant that it looks like it until you get into close to light speed and then you find out it's not okay time travel is very possible so the speed of light is not something that's going to stop you going forward. It's not a limit. You can continue to go as fast as you want. Gravity is not a well. It's a function of magnetism. You know, these were basic things wrong with relativity. And as a navigator in space, these were things that I had to know. And what they said was the basis for proper physics was a combination of electric universe and quantum mechanics. And until earth physics goes back to electronics instead of relativity, they're going to continue to not get things right. Now, it doesn't much matter when it's a car, but when it's a spaceship going through hyperspace, that stuff matters a lot. The math there was base 60, which meant that a lot of the irrational numbers that we have on base 10 were not irrational anymore. They were solid numbers on a base 60. But the Germans had gotten that from the ET allies. So you have every astral body is like a magnet. It has, an, it has a positive and a negative pole. And some of, some of these astral bodies, it's more than one place. So they're not like unipolar, they're all over the place. And that each astral body in a system is tied to the star by portals. And these portals, the endpoints change as the astral body rotates. Um, it sounds insane to people who haven't been taught it. So this, this is part of the basics of the system 
that the Germans use for space travel because you can piggyback on those portals. And there are stargates in the sun that will take you to other star systems. Um, star systems form in clusters of five, six, up to, up to 20 different stars okay. that kind clusters, of rotate yeah. together. Yeah. Clusters that are similar to a mini galaxy. And they, they travel together. And the change in position is very slow relative to the lifespans of humans. You know, we live very short lives relative to motions in space. Some of the other races, like the Draco, live half a million years. So they've had more time to watch this stuff. This one day, the guards must have failed because the raptors came through the wall of the cafeteria. And I hadn't been there very long, a year or two, so I was no more than 11. And this was the first memory that I got back with my memories being restored. It was the one that was slapping me in the face. Mars raptors coming through the wall at us uh -huh. and they were they, they have six inch claws on their well they have three fingers no thumbs so they have claws uh -huh. like a regular raptor by the way the raptors on mars look like jurassic park raptors with longer arms they so. do come in those color variations and they do have the various i guess you'd call them proto feathers they're not exactly horns, okay. but that's something people don't know is that dinosaurs had feathers. So um, birds are dinosaurs. And they were going through and killing kids. And my instinct was to put up a shield, and like a bubble shield, force field, around as many of us as I could. And we were still in that when the adults figured out there was a problem and came in and started fight fighting back. Okay. And they took out the raptors. And finally, when everything was calm, the force field released and we were, we were out of it. And the adults went and... <laughs> redialed and res rescued everybody that had been killed. So no one was lost. It's like they're using personal portal tech. So it's just a limited area that they are actually going. They're actually going into hyperspace. And it, when you are in hyperspace, your timeline is like a river in front of you. And you have stepped up onto the bank. And you're watching the river still flowing beside you. And you can go upstream, which is back in time. You can go downhill, which is forward in time. You can pick a different, you can, instead of being on this world you can jump to that world this is how ships travel in space and this is the way we redialed to rescue people on a small operation like this you had a group of four or five people with personal portal tech they stepped out together they stepped back in time together they would each grab a kid or two and pull them back into present time. The rest of us were unaffected at all. We still had full memories of everything that had happened. We just had our classmates back. This was something that came up totally by instinct, and I was not taught this at Langley. 
and it was big enough for 40 kids. So it was it was huge, and the raptors were raking on it. They were trying to get through, and I knew this did not happen on Earth, and it took me two years to figure out what that was. And once I figured out where that was and how it happened, the rest of the memories started falling into place. It was the third year after my memory was reactivated that I had enough of the story together to be able to talk about it. I remember a class, I would have been 12, 13 years old. It was a class about the other races we would be likely to be exposed to. They were not all local Mars races, okay. but they were races that were known to frequent the solar system. And there were about 20 of them. And we were taught everything about them and including how to kill them. This was considered to be a self-defense course. There were three races that we were told do not attempt to kill them. Just leave them the fuck alone. Do not engage. One of them was Aldabaran. Actually, they look just like us. Okay. They're just nasty as hell. There, uh, there was one set of German ships that, that showed up there. Well, after all, they had been talking to Ma Maria Orsic. And so the Germans thought they had an invitation. And they showed up in orbit and were immediately disintegrated. You do not show up there without an invitation. Even with an invitation, it's not a good idea. They are basically, the, there's a zone around their star. You don't go there. We were told about the Lyrans and told to not engage. The Lyrans are um, from the constellation Lyra. They're, they're taller than us, a couple of feet. So you're talking over two meters tall. And they evolve from large cats. Do not engage. No matter what you do, they are difficult at best. We're attacking meeting them in the field. Yeah, we're talking meeting them on the oh, surface okay. of Mars. We were not to engage with Lyrans. We were told about the seven races of the Draco. Uh -huh. And the six subject races don't like being called Draco. Okay. So but I can't are. remember what their names are. They're they're all different. They're all different species. And they don't interbreed. They rarely even talk to each other except through chain of command. Uh -huh. Bosses are always alphas, and the alphas have a chain of command, and they all answer to the queen, or the queen mother, or both. And we were told if you are dealing with an alpha drac on your own, you do not engage. It was the Germans that said that. You do not engage with any of the draconian races if you are on your own, period. The Draco are much superior in every way right. that I've seen. They're taller, they're bigger, they're stronger. Their base intelligence level starts at 300 IQ and goes up from there. A 300 IQ Draco is considered retarded. So they're sci they have psionic abilities that, that are beyond anything any human has ever had. 
and engaging with one against orders is basically calling to be killed. So it was practical advice. You just don't mess with them. The Draco are an empire. There's always at least four or five coup attempts going on in mm. any given point. You have a empire run by a queen and her sisters and her daughters. And they occasionally get a bug up their butt that they'd make a better queen. You have factions going on. And it's a political landmine. Deal with them. And that's on the best of days. And if the queen has had to deal with having to kill one of her sisters who tried to kill her, she's not going to be in a good mood to deal with you. That was basically Exopolitics 101. I was taught that in Shula. In Shula, that last three or four years, you're taught your specialization. It's based on your genetic capabilities. It's not based on on something as arbitrary as what you want to do. It's based on they've tested you genetically. They've regressed you and found out what you were at soul level, what you have been in past lives. They they know what you're capable of, and they test. They train you for the best use of your capabilities. But that, that's the last three years. It's not It's not at the beginning. At the beginning, oh. you have all human teachers, and they are all Germans. And you are speaking German, and you are living in a German community, and you go to school for four hours a day, and you work in the colony gardens for another three hours a day, you don't have homework. Uh -huh. You do everything in class. You might, after we were starting our specialization, we would have glass pads, uh -huh. and we would have books to read there. I had a Jurakan, uh -huh. that's the Draco Warriors, teaching hand him combat. Or in our in our case, avoiding being hit by him. He was not quite twice my height. But yeah, um, he was just a little bigger than the Mars Raptors, which would have been our Maybe. battle opponents. Maybe. So if you can beat something that's a little bigger than your battle appointment, yeah, those were our main appointments. Opponents in warfare were the Mars Raptors, and he was a little bigger because they're turtles. He wasn't as mobile at the waist as, as the Raptors were, but he made a good stand in. And uh, we had a couple of Greys that came in and taught us about, taught me about navigation. And uh, there were a lot of um, worker Draco. And they're about the same size as the Mars Raptors. Okay. But uh, I don't remember what they taught. I remember seeing them. Uh, the Psy abilities were usually taught by Greys because they could show us without killing us. The Draco tended to over-energize it. Oh. And even though we were modified to live around Draco when they were trying to do the psionic oh. abilities, they could overdo it real easily. But they did teach us that when you step into someone's mind, you're polite, you don't stomp. I've had humans on Earth think they were reading me, and it just felt like somebody stomping through my head with army boots. <laughs> oh. 
they taught us not to do that. Yeah, because you had to talk to them in their heads. Uh, they they would talk to us with their mouths when they had to. But during the psionics testing, you had to be telepathic. Yeah. You had to talk to them full intimacy telepathy, where nothing is being held back, everything is there. But when you talk to the greys, you had to have a barrier because they didn't want you knowing everything in their head. You had to learn both methods and who they were appropriate with. Interesting. There wasn't a graduation ceremony for us. There was for the colonist kids. So we went to the last day of school, and they gave us a couple of days to adjust that we weren't in school anymore. And then we were given our assignments. I remember getting the flight suit. And it was like, what? But I'm female. <laughs> but no, it was a flight suit. And um, the basic one for Mars was, in those days, was red and black. But mine was this dark blue. And I'm, and I'm like, you know, why? Well, you're U.S. Navy on loan to us. So you wear a U.S. Navy uniform. This made no sense to me at all, but I knew better than to question it. And the flight suit was the preliminary stage of something that became a smart suit, which would respond only to your personal DNA and eliminated the need for you to fee to be fed or go to the bathroom. You still had to drink water, but you could go six weeks without eating in it. And if you had the helmet on, it, it functioned as a spacesuit. So that was something for shuttle pilots and the ones that weren't cyborgs. Um, there is an external exoskeleton that the super soldiers use. It's, there's a whole set of things that are made by Aegis for the super soldiers. And they are a heavier suit that's in between fatigues and, and spacesuits, and an exoskeleton that goes over that. And it can have a helmet or not. And then there's a version for the fighter pilots off of a mothership. And they have a surgically implanted exoskeleton that anchors at the base of the skull and into the SI joints. And that's painful as hell. And Mars has an atmosphere. It's just like being at... 8,000 foot elevation. So it, the air is thin. It's too thin to do extreme exercise. But just sitting, talking, walking around a little bit, you, you do fine. NASA is lying. If you're going to be doing something strenuous, you need um, an oxygen supplement. So most, most of the soldiers wear an oxygen pack and uh, it comes across the nose and it just gives them enough oxygen to come up to par. But it's like Earth at about 8,000 feet. The sky's a light blue unless there's a sandstorm, then it turns red. The reason that it, it looks brown up close and red from a distance is because it has some really higher iron content in the dirt. Um, there are places where it has obviously been hit with lightning strikes and the iron has melted out of the dirt and formed little balls of iron. They show up in some of the rover photos. That's what they're calling blueberries. 
Mars used to have a full ecology just like on Earth. There were great oceans on top that are now underground and frozen. The water's still there, it's just underground. And there were two things that happened. One was there was a planet that came too close and there was an exchange of both dirt and air between the two planets and Mars lost more than it gained and the other was there was a nuclear war and we know that because of the isotopes that were left in the northern hemisphere and that was before the Germans nuked the the native wildlife so there is both of these are in ancient history and the ecology is what survived both incidences so it's those creatures who require less food less water less air and are able to live in freezing conditions at night so you have insects, you have reptiles, you have um, burrowing mammals, you have burrowing birds. Um, those are the major life forms. The, all of the sentient life forms are, have underground cities. There is a burrowing animal, a mammal, that looks a lot like a capybara. It's like a, a half meter long guinea pig legs except in these ones, the legs were for burrowing so they were thicker and they had burrowing claws and their eyes didn't open as much and they were herbivores there's a creature there that's like an ichthyosaurus but it's small it's not it's not the size the ones on earth were it's about five foot tall, you know, because it's flu. It walks on its flippers, and there's uh, there's lots of snakes, lots of snakes. Animals on Mars have adapted to the the cold mostly by burrowing, and the insects and reptiles are cold blooded, so they just go dormant at night and they require less oxygen and less food. So they've done quite well surviving in the conditions there. In the daytime it, at the equator it gets to about 70 degrees, which is really nice. And at the poles it's about 50, which is consistent with still temperate zones in, in on Earth. The trouble is the night gets really deadly cold and you need to have shelter then or a spacesuit. Even in the equatorial regions it gets really cold at night. But if you have some sort of a shelter or you're in a spacesuit or <sighs> the soldiers have a suit that's made by Aegis and a lot of the soldiers will use that and then have some sort of a it's like a tent, but it holds heat better. And so they'll just set up their tent for the night and they're good till morning. And the day is about 28 hours instead of 24. So things last a little longer. Uh, the night's a little longer, the day's a little longer. Sunset's a little longer, which sunset you get the night sky coming and then you have this edge right around where the sun is that's lavender and it's where sunsets on earth are are orange or pink or red on mars it's lavender and it lasts about an hour mars looked like the part of northern arizona that has the really short grasses and shrubs so that you can see the dirt but there are still plants there Actually, the trees are at the poles. It snows at the poles, and in the springtime, 
it all thaws and wa deeply waters the plants. The South Pole in particular has huge forests. Yeah, springtime on Mars is just absolutely gorgeous. There are trees that are like junipers, but the leaves are thicker to withstand the cold. There are cactuses, there are shrubs, grasses, wildflowers. All those green stripes you see are grasses. Mars, where I was, had an assortment of small bushes, shrubs, wildflowers after it rained, some really tough grasses. So all of the plants there were adapted to that sudden everyday shock of getting cold. And they were thick and had their water would, would suck from, from the outer leaves into the stems so that they wouldn't freeze during the night. Never. I remember there being light clouds and kind of a mist would fall, but it never really hit the ground. Yeah. It evaporates so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, except at the, when I was stationed at the, pole, the North Pole, um, it would hit and, and freeze. It's more so on the Southern Hemisphere. Um, there's, there's a whole miles and miles and miles of water in the summertime that's about two, three feet deep. Miles and miles. It would look like an ocean if it were on Earth. It's just not very deep. And it freezes at night, thaws out in the daytime. Um, there's more water at the poles. And that's why all the life forms have shifted to the poles is because of the water. You have to have water to live. You have to have air to live. And the air situation, you have like in that big canyon on the face of Mars. In the bottom of that, there's more oxygen than at the top. So you get more life forms in the valleys than you do in the mountaintops because e even in the valleys, you're talking about the equivalent of 8,000 foot elevation on earth. And when you go to the mountains, you're talking closer 12,000 feet. And so the oxygen level alone makes a difference in what kind of life forms you're going to see. And Complicating all of that are the sandstorms that will go around the planet for months on end. And they get so staticky that the lightning bolts will hit Phobos and make it ring like a bell. That's why wow. all of the cities and military bases on Mars are underground is because the EMF from the sandstorms will take out all electronics on the surface. The entire base, except for where the planes take off, okay. is underground. The effect of that system going over your base is basically like getting an EM pulse mm -hmm. that takes out all of the surface electronics. So anything that's sitting on the surface is going to be destroyed, useless. You'll have a beautiful pile of trash. And the pilots were expected to fly above this uh -huh. and try not to get hit by the lightning and find a base that they could go to and be underground with their ship during these things. So we were... Everybody was basically housebound during these storms. And so I graduated at 19 and was put behind the, well, I would say steering wheel, except it was a mouse pad, <laughs> uh, of a fighter jet. And we were in a war that the Germans started. 
the war was with the Mars mantids and the Mars raptors. And these are both formidable enemies. When the Germans got there, every square inch was already owned by somebody else. And they had a lease from the Draco. And the Draco terms were not exactly favorable. And where they had, where, where the Draco gave them was not a good place for humans to live. It was really hard to defend. It was really hard to air condition, which meant keep it warm at night. It was, it was hard to secure it against the other life forms in the area. And they found several places that were much more suitable to humans and the only legal way to get it was to remove the owners. All of the rooms were way too big for us because Draco are close to twice our size. Some of them are three times our size. Mm -hmm. And this had been built for them, by them. And so we were inhabiting somebody else's thing mm -hmm. and everything was too big. So we built our own smaller shelters inside theirs. So um, the deal with the Draco required so many humans given to them on, on a regular period. Okay. I was told that when the people were picked up that there was a lot of screaming. So... The Germans found this offensive. Okay, I do know from my personal interactions with Draco and from watching what happened to the humans around me, normal Earth humans who have not been modified usually drop dead within a half an hour of contact with Draco. And the Draco hasn't done anything to them. Okay. They operate at a higher energy volume. And their energy field is a lot larger than ours. And it literally fries the brains. Hmm of a normal human to be around them and they haven't done anything wrong they're just they're just there so um that was the cia's excuse for using draco dna on us what was so we could interact with them and it turned out to be correct because i can be around them all day no problems hmm. and they have never once tried to hurt me they have never been rude they've never called me a raka that's their it's it's a combined fool and slave yeah. they use that for normal humans because they can't be around them and um that's why you very rarely see a draco on earth is because they're not here they're not out to hurt us as f the ones i've interacted with have not been now i hear all kinds of bullshit there are thousands of reptilian races out there they are not all draco there are seven that are draco <laughs> and they don't even like each other <laughs> so um out of the thousands of reptilian races, there are 12 that eat people. Yeah. The representatives of the Draco Empire, they do not have a large population there. And Draco rule an empire and the solar system is kind of in the middle of it. So they're not going anywhere anytime soon. So if you want a place you can live, you have to take it. So we did. And then we were in war. And the war started in 1962. 
and the treaties were signed in 1990. So this was a hell of a war. The only reason that we won the right to be there, we being the Germans, we won the right to be there because the mantids, the insectoids not from Mars had given the Germans regen technology. So part of my job was to find human remains, bring them back so that they could be regenerated. They can literally bring a person back from the dead for up to four months. Now, imagine that when you're trying to recruit new people from Earth. You know, it gets pretty easy. You just go into the cancer ward and say, well, you know, we can make the pain stop. How many people are not even going to ask what, what they're going to use you for? You know, this is the kind of thing that's going on. Human trafficking is not just children. The planet had been split up between the Draco, the Mars Raptors, the Insectoids. And there is, there is one city of tall whites an underground city in the southern hemisphere and the tall whites are the blue collar people you know the working class of what history calls the Anunnaki okay the Anunnaki are who earth's sky gods are and those beings are their royals their royal family now the royal family wasn't all there was. They have blue collar people that do working class jobs too. And that's who the tall whites are. They're working class. And they have a city of approximately 10 million of their people underground on Mars in the Southern hemisphere. And because the tall whites were underground, they didn't bother them. They also have bases in Tanzania, in um, Puerto Rico, in Pine Gap, Australia, and Area 51 and 54 in Nevada. Now, I've been hearing about other places in addition to, so these are just the ones I know about. So, you know, that's not... This is bare minimum. There's probably more. Um, the Anunnaki never left. I mean, most of their royals went home, but the Anunnaki themselves never left. They just stopped interacting with humans. And that would have been about 1900 BC. Mm -hmm. It's about time in their their orbit for them to start being more obvious in our world. So when I got there in 1964, the Germans were already at war with their neighbors. And the places that they had wanted belonged to the Mars Raptors and the Mars Mantids. Uh, those are classifications. They're not species names. A raptor literally looks like Jurassic Park raptors, except they have arms like people. They still have the three claws, and they're as long as your hand is, and they're as sharp as razors. And in an unarmed fight, they will win every time. They're a little over two meter, meters tall, okay. uh, seven foot in, in American measurements. Okay. And the Northern hemisphere has green ones and the Southern hemisphere has brown ones. Okay. And they're the same species, they're just a variant. Yeah. So th they are a telepathic race. They are shocked 
when they run across a human that's telepathic. They think we're fools. They think we're dangerous fools. And they had survived both both events and were had crawled back up to the Neolithic stage when the Germans nuked them. <clears throat> the Germans were using proton bombs so that it would kill the organic life and leave the buildings habitable. They just had to wait to move in. Your level of technology de is dependent on your ability to produce it. And so when their cities were destroyed, their technology was destroyed. So this war put them back into the Stone Age. They came at us with everything they had and then some. And they were vicious because this was a fight to the death. And um, because we are reliant on technology to compete with them. The American Department of Defense has decided to exterminate them because at some point humans go through a cycle where we lose our technology and they, they feel that at that point the raptors will be a threat. So they're going to eliminate the threat now. So they've been testing weapons on these people. These are intelligent, spiritual beings. They're just reptilian. And they do eat humans. They eat, their favorite food are the Mars native humans. The mantids there don't look like praying mantises. They look like ants. They have two two or three digits at the end of their their two top two sets of arms but they have the fingers are about this long and they're sharp and so they're effectively claws even though they're not and i've seen mantids when they're frightened cut a human in half with those so a fair fight, the human will lose. They have antenna like, like ants on Earth. They usually have the front arms up, and the back two pair of legs are used to walk with. They do have wings that they can bring up. And they're called mantids instead of ants because they don't have that, that tiny separator between the thorax and the abdomen that ants on earth do oh, okay. so the body is one chunk like a mantid rather than an ant but otherwise they're very ant-like and they tend to have a cave opening to um, their hive and they do operate as a hive and they're very telepathic they have they're almost all female. They have a queen who dominates the hive telepathically and tells everybody what to do. And uh, she does all the thinking for all of them. So if you capture one for intel, it's like capturing the queen. You can get information until she decides she's had enough and then that one will just drop dead. <laughs> And they are not the same as the Mantid Empire. The Mantid Empire gave the Germans the regen technology. They have the basic body shape of a mantis, but their heads are shaped differently. Grasshopper-like. Okay, we in the space programs, we use the term mantid mm -hmm. pretty much like bug. It's any intelligent... Um, insectoid race that is of a hive mind. So the mantids on Mars, we had orders from the German militia that if we were confronted by one to not resist its telepathy because it's going to hear what's in your head anyway. 
and resistance will get you killed. And they would rather have us alive. They understand that if you're interacting with an actual Draco or with a Mantid, that you are not going to be able to hide anything in your mind. So it's not considered betrayal. It's an understanding of the realities. They were a unified people, and they were completely peaceful until the Germans attacked them. And they, were, they are a space-faring race. They are an intelligent race. So they're not, we're not talking about primitive, dangerous. We're talking about something that, that's superior to us. Oh, and, you know, we've been, we've been attacking them for space. So okay. we are the aggressors there. That's important for people to understand. We went there and we started bombing the neighbors. They managed to escape the worst of the bombing. And so they were also fighting us. Which is, so you had <sighs> two formidable races pissed as hell that we had bombed their cities and had moved into them. And the sheer chutzpah of, of the Germans to do this was just like beyond belief. You know, and I'm I'm sitting there watching this and going, how did they get by with this? They, no, the Jacob were actually pretty pissed about it because yeah. I remember when we were going to we were going to leave Ari Ari's Prima because we were moving and we were told you can't leave. You have to find somebody else to fill out your to finish out your lease if you leave. It was a matter of rent. It, we had to stay there and pay our rent or find somebody else who would. And that was when they let the CIA move into the other half. In the southern hemisphere of Mars, that war is still ongoing because the raptors there refused to sign treaties. Uh, there was a real problem with the Germans not honoring the treaties in 1990, give or take five years. And in that time frame, the Germans and the Draco had signed treaties with both the Mars Mantids and the Mars Raptors. And the Germans found some piece of ancient technology that they wanted really, really bad, and it was being held by, I believe it was the Mantids. And they were basically told no. And so they, they sent in a battalion of Americans to take this. And this is what Randy Kramer calls the Battle of the Blender, because they got into this site and they had to go through this tunnel and they were basically shredded as they went in. And it was my personal commander who had ordered it. And I witnessed my commander being gutted by his commander, who was a Draco, for having no honor for not honoring the treaty that the Draco had signed with us. So there were consequences to the man that did this. Um, after the Draco left the room, the rest of us took this guy and dubbed him into Regen, and he was a lot more humble after that. But this, this is the state of, of the stupidity that was going on. Whatever the tech item was, the Germans thought it was worth violating the treaties. And the others were not going to part with it at all. Uh, there are still issues with both the Germans and the Americans violating the rights of the native races to get tech. 
it's surviving items from the past that these races have honored as holy relics and so the human the earth humans are going through and basically trying to get all of the stuff they can find because nobody gives them advanced tech willingly after all what do we do with it <laughs> 